Ha, huh, good. Hello. Um, let's see. I have a problem with my clicker. Sorry. Okay, we'll uh, survive without the clicker. So uh, we are talking about um, graphs, we are talking about page rank, and today we are going to talk about some extensions of page rank, and then I'll show you some uh, some examples to, of how to use page rank for recommender systems, and I'll show you about how to use page rank uh, to combat web spam. So to, uh, to, give a, to give an overview what, oh, and a summary of what we did uh, last uh, lecture, we came up with this metric that uh, allows us to score importances of the nodes in the graph. And if we were to, given, to, we were to be given this kind of uh, uh, directed graph, the, the sizes of the nodes and the numbers in the nodes correspond to the, to the importances of, or scores of these nodes in the graph. And notice how it makes sense that nodes with a lot of uh, incoming edges uh, get a high degree, like uh, have high importance, like the node B. Um, node C that has only one inlink, but it gets this inlink from the very important node B has just a bit less importance than the B itself, and so on and so forth. So this makes a lot of sense. And how did we compute this? The way we computed this was that we um, came up with this um, uh, random walk interpretation of page rank where we said that this is a process where a random walker walks the graph and at any step the walker can navigate to a random, uh, to a random uh, page by following a link or can decide to teleport itself and land to a random node. And um, we showed that the way you can then create this um, stochastic adjacency, uh, this stochastic transition matrix that captures the walker is that you create the matrix M and then add in this uh, random jump um, uh, probability uh, matrix, add the two together, and now this is your tran transition probability um, of the random walker. And then what did we say also is, is that um, the way you could solve, solve this and find uh, the stationary distribution um, uh, over this uh, transition matrix is to use what we call the power method, where we start with some random vector and we keep multiplying it with our matrix A and eventually the thing will, um, the thing will converge. Uh, to a stationary vector, and we also said that this is the eigenvector that corresponds to the principal eigenvalue of the matrix A. That eigenvalue has value 1, and here is the corresponding eigenvector. So somehow this uh, intuition or this explanation of the random walker walking around and this kind of linear algebra eigenvector eigenvalue um, methodology kind of came beautifully together in this algorithm that allows us to compute uh, uh, what is the stationary probability distribution of the random walker being at a given state uh, or at a given node. And what we also said is that, um, that uh, this, this distribution, what is interesting about it is it doesn't matter where we started, right? So it doesn't matter where the walker starts after some time the starting point doesn't matter, that distribution over which node is a walker at converges to a steady state. So uh, this is what we were talking about, and then I gave you um, the pseudocode for the algorithm, how would you implement this, um, when we talked about the dead ends and uh, spider traps. So here is the algorithm that allows you to deal with um, uh, dead ends and spider traps, where essentially the idea is that first we compute the contribution uh, the, the, the score of a given node by the scores of its neighbors and then collecting that score, basically dividing it by the out degree of that node, multiplying it with beta, and that says how likely is a random walker to walk to you. And then um, summing up all these scores, let's call that S. This S will sum up to less than 1 because uh, we are multiplying with beta here that is less than 1, and we also have some random, um, some random walk um, uh, mass uh, uh, leaking out because of the dead ends. So essentially what we are saying is this is how far away the sum of the scores is from 1. Let's split that evenly across all the nodes and each one gets an equal share, right? So here I'm saying for every node my estimate of the page rank score is whatever it gets from uh, the transitioning the link plus whatever is the contribution from leaking out 
and the, uh, and the teleportation. And I keep um, iterating this until the, my, my estimate between two consecutive time steps uh, converges, meaning it changes for less, less than epsilon. Uh, it turns out that in less than 50 iterations, this will, this will converge. So um, you can run this on, on, on large, large graphs as we talked um, at the end of the lecture with this striping algorithm and blocking and so on. So you can run this on Hadoop um, and you need very little memory. So um, what are some things to think about uh, about this approach, right? So first thing is that this just kind of measures the generic, in some sense, popularity or, or importance of the web page um, in, the, in the graph. Um, and kind of doesn't really take any, consid any consideration about the topic of the web page. So what we'll talk about next is something called topic specific page rank, or um, it is also known as random walk with restarts. Uh, I'll talk about that, right? Um, and then what we will also talk about is, you know, some other models of importance of nodes in the graph. Um, and then how I will uh, finish the lecture today is talk to you about the link spam, right? So how do, how could you spam the web and how can you use this type of uh, strategies to identify fake spammy engineered parts of the web? Okay, so kind of artificial link topologies that are created there to boost page rank of given uh, pages, okay? So first thing I want to talk about is topic specific uh, page rank. And what uh, topic specific page rank is is that instead of computing the generic popularity of a web page, we want to measure the popularity or importance of a web page with, re with respect to a given topic, okay? So here is our goal. The goal is to evaluate web pages not by just how important they are according to the overall graph structure, but we want to somehow measure how important they are with respect to a particular, let's call it topic, like sports or history and so on. And the idea is that, right, when you, when you use this in the search engine, you have the sports, you can take a query, you can cla classify a query into a category saying, oh, is this a sports query? Is it a, a political query? Is it a history query? And then if you can classify a query, then the idea would be that you can, um, you can then surface the web pages that are important with respect to that topic of the query and not just generically important in the graph, right? So the idea would be if, you know, somebody searches for Trojan, then, you know, maybe they want different web pages depending whether they are interested in sports, history, or uh, computer security, right? And maybe based on the interests of the user, I could kind of say, what, what is my guess that the user means by this query, okay? So this is where the idea of topic specific page rank comes, fr comes from. So here is how we will think of topic specific page rank, okay? So we will say that, um, right, we know that the, uh, our intuition or our uh, conceptual way of thinking of page rank is this random walker who can decide to take a step or can decide to teleport, okay? Um, and if the walker uh, teleports, um, the question is where do they teleport to, right? Where is the walker going to land? And in the standard page rank we said they are going to land at any page with equal probability, okay? So we say whenever the, tele the random walker teleports, it just lands somewhere on the graph everywhere with equal probability. So kind of chooses the landing spot uniformly at random. And then what topic specific page rank says it says, oh, whenever the random walker teleports, it won't land just anywhere, but it will land at a topic specific set of relevant pages, right? So all we are doing is when the landing happens, we constrain the la landing to a set of nodes. And we call this set the teleport set, okay? So just again, what's the difference? The difference is that where does the, where, where does the walker land? In the standard page rank, walker lands everywhere kind of uniformly at random, so picks a random page, while in the topic specific page rank the idea is that the walker lands at a random page out of the teleport set. And then how can you use this um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to compute now the topic specific page rank, right? The idea is that whenever the walker teleports or the random surfer teleports, she picks a page from the teleport set S. And this S contains only pages that are relevant to a given topic, right? How would you now find pages that are relevant to a given topic? 
you can use, let's say, open directory or DMOS and so on that to say, oh, for a given topic, what are the authoritative pages? And when the random walker jumps and wants to land, they can only land in this set S, right? Um, so this means, right, that for every teleport set S, we get a different page rank vector R sub S, okay? So one way you can uh, think about this is that now when we are measuring the importance of the node in the graph, we are measuring it with respect to the teleport set S, right? Because the random walker walks and then jumps to the set and then walks, walks, walks and jump be jumps back to the set. So now for every set, I have a different uh, page rank vector, a different importance for every node because de depending where I jump, the proximities will be different, right? That's essentially the idea of what is called topic specific page rank or what also people call as personalized page rank, right? And the idea is that we just have this concept of a teleport set. That's, that's, that's it, even though it's called topic specific or whatever, it's just we have a teleport set. Now, how do you do this? How would you, how would you, how does this change our algorithm? It changes it in, in very small way, right? The only way, the, the way it changes when we are conceptually thinking of this matrix Aij, we only add this one minus beta term, right? One minus beta times we had one over n, where n is the number of nodes in the graph. Now I have one over s because s is the teleport set. And only the nodes that are in the teleport set get this landing probability term, right? And if the node is not in the teleport set, then it just gets the transition probability multiplied by beta, right? So all we did, like in the standard page rank, essentially we put every node to be in the set S. So, you know, it was the top equation and the division by the size of S was division by the size of the network. Now I make S to be smaller than the entire network, to be a subset of the network. So only nodes that are in S get this additional boost in importance. And uh, I need, I, and because the random walker has equal probability here to land at any of the nodes in S, each one gets one over S mass multiplied by um, uh, one minus beta, right? Um, so, um, so this still means A is a stochastic matrix and essentially, what did we do is we weighted here all the, s all the pages in the teleport set equally, right? The landing probability at any of the pages in S is equal. But of course, you could make that have different landing probabilities if you have some way to estimate that, right? So you can play with this term here as much as you want, right? And you can bias this landing however you want, right? And then, um, the same way, uh, how would you compute now the personalized page rank? You would compute it the same way as the, as the regular page rank. You just have to be careful when you are inserting back in the leaked page rank is that every node um, um, gets the, the proportion of the link, leaked page rank and then only the nodes in the teleport set S get the, get the, rand, get the landing probability part of the, of the, um, of the, of the uh, mass of the random walk. And you can still maintain sparseness and everything works. Okay, any, any questions? All good? It's a small modification, but it's actually a kind of an amazingly powerful one. Mathematically, everything stays the same, but now it really allows you to play with the definition of S. Good? Yeah, all right. So uh, give you an example. Here is an example of, of my graph and a, a topic specific uh, page rank, right? Here are my uh, transition probabilities over the edges. Imagine I set my teleport set to be a single node, node number one. I can now, um, you know, s whenever, uh, whenever I, I, uh, the random walker decides to jump, it uh, lands at node one, okay? And if I do this, uh, and I run my power iteration. Here are my, uh, my scores. And you know, if I run it after a couple of iterations, uh, here is how um, the, scores, uh, the scores converge, right? So from that point of view, um, node um, um, number, uh, sorry, this way, right? Uh, iterations, nodes, right? So I started with one quarter. Uh, this is where I end. Uh, according to this node three, is the most important, then it's node one, node two, node four, and uh, node two. And then 
what I want to do here in this more dense slide, if I say here is my, all the nodes are in my teleport set, so this is, this is standard page rank score, uh, here is how the scores would be. So for example, um, you know, the node 1 would have 0.13, now node 1 has 0 0.21, uh, 29. The node number 2 kind of maintains, maintains about the same importance, uh, but uh, nodes um, 3 uh, and 4 losing their importance quite a lot. And uh, here I'm showing you, you know, how would these importances look like if you choose different uh, teleport sets, right? If your teleport set changes, beta, um, uh, 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 but is constant between, between different, uh, different cases. And I have, and I have uh, more, right? So for example, what happens if I keep the teleport set fixed, but I changed beta? Basically what it means with large beta, my random walker walks farther out, and with smaller beta it tend to jump back to node 1 uh, sooner. So what is happening is as I decrease beta, the, the importance of node 1 is increasing because the random walker is taking less steps and jumping back to node number 1 uh, more, uh, more often. And then the importance of other nodes in the network is decreasing uh, because Walker tends to spend more and more time in node no number one. The reason for that being is we are jumping back uh, uh, faster and faster, right? Uh, that's the that's the that's the idea, right? Like with point eight um, in expectation, the walker takes uh, five steps. Um, with point nine, it takes about ten steps. Um, with point seven, it takes about three steps before it jumps back, right? So um, and you see how the walker now the stationary distribution. When we say what is our belief where in the graph is the walker, the more it's jumping back, the more it has to spend time at the node 1 where it jumps back to, okay? So that's the, that's the idea. I want to quickly uh, address this idea of how do you choose the topic vector, right? One option is that you take um, the big uh, categories of web pages like on, uh, on uh, this website called Demos that is kind of a community maintained directory of trustworthy web pages, a big hierarchy, and at the top this hierarchy has 16 categories, 16 top level categories. Um, and then, you know, you could ask uh, which topic ranking to use. You could say, aha, uh -huh, I will ask, the user will come and tell me what kind of results they want uh, based on what topic. You could, as I said before, classify a query into a topic and then use the ranking according to that uh, personalized or, or uh, uh, topic specific page rank score. Um, or you could use uh, the context of the query, right? Like if you have a search box on various web pages, then based on the context of the web page, you could try to guess the topic. Um, you could um, use a history of the queries. So that when people, you know, first maybe search for basketball, but then search for Jordan, you know who this Jordan is. That might be different than, you know, the UC Berkeley professor, Mike Jordan. They are both Mike Jordans, but very different professions, right? Um, or you could, you know, use some kind of context like users' bookmarks and so on to come up with a teleport set, right? But the idea is that you would pre-compute now many different page rank vectors, each one for a different uh, topic, uh, topic vector. When I say a topic vector, I mean for a given uh, topic specific teleport set. And then you could use that at ranking time when you say, aha, uh -huh, user has a query. I retrieve all the pages with that keyword, but I have to sort the web pages. I will sort them according to the page rank score, um, but, a, but according to a topic specific uh, page rank score. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about personalized page rank um, or topic specific page rank. Any, any questions? Okay, so moving on then. Um, what we will now do is essentially take this per, uh, topic specific page rank where we had a teleport set to be a set of nodes and we'll push that and say a set of nodes S is a single node. And uh, what this will allow us to do is, one way you can think about it is to say the, te the teleport set S is a set of nodes where the random walker starts its walk, right? So what, so what the score of every other node that is not in S really means, it means what is the proximity in some sense of that node to the, to the teleport set, right? The idea is you have the teleport set out of which the random walker starts. And in some sense then the page rank score tells you how close 
is, is some node with regard to that teleport set, right? Now we will say the teleport set is a single node. So that in some sense will allow us to almost like quantify distance or proximity between the starting node and any other node uh, in the graph. And this will be, as I will show you, extremely powerful, right? So what do we want to do is, given a graph, I somehow want to quantify how related or how close are A and B in this graph, right? And uh, I would like to do this at some kind of intuitive level, right? Like if I would do shortest path distance, then for example, the, the top two graphs um, on the left, I would say that A and B have the similar strength of uh, connection, right? Like there are two hops apart in the top case and the two hops ap apart in the bottom case. But what I would argue is that they are closer in the top example than in the bottom example because here D has all these other connections. So maybe the strength or importance of these connections is not that important, right? So I would say that on the, uh, on the top case A and B are closer to each other than in this case um, where uh, D is kind of scattered, right? So this is one case and then here is another case Right, I have two examples where on the top between A and B there are these two different paths while here at the bottom there is just one path. And maybe I would like to say that, um, that the proximity between A and B on the top is, is larger. They are kind of more connected because there's different ways to get from one node to the other, okay? Um, and this is what I would like to somehow uh, quantify, right? And I can, for example, um, in this case, what would I, one, one thing that I could do is I could have this kind of flow formulation where I say I have one unit of a flow on, on at node A and I want to push this water, this flow all the way to node B. How quickly can I do that on the top case? How quickly can I do that at the bottom case? And I would say on the top I, can, I have more highways so we can transport that flow faster to B than I can do it uh, at the bottom case, right? But you know, here is an example where the network flow is equal between A and B in both cases. Even here the path is longer and up there the path is shorter, right? So kind of the flow formulation wouldn't punish long paths. So what we would really like is we would like a method that kind of considers multiple connections, multiple paths, direct in and indirect connections, as well as degrees of the nodes. Right? If I say what's the proximity between A and B, I want to kind of consider all paths in the graph. I want to and see how, like, how close are um, A and B. And the idea how to do this um, is called um, sim rank or it's called random walk with restarts. And essentially what this will boil down to, it will be, it will boil down to a topic specific page rank where, um, where the, uh, where the teleport set is the starting node and every other node is kind of the, uh, the, the node to which we are measuring proximity. Um, and this turns out to be extremely uh, useful for uh, recommender systems um, and kind of online applications where you can create this kind of bipartite graph of people to products or for example if you want to recommend uh, conferences or authors you say authors publish at conferences, their papers um, uh, have certain sets of tags or, um, or uh, titles, and you can start creating this type of bipartite or n-partite graphs on which you can then uh, run um, a personalized page rank or random walk with restart type algorithm, right? So what we will do is we'll talk about topic specific page rank from a given node u, which basically means that our teleport set will be that node u um, and nothing else. So it means that whenever the walker will jump, it will jump back to the starting node u. And sometimes people call this random walk with restarts because when you jump, you essentially restart the walk. You go back to the beginning, okay? Um, and now the resulting scores in some sense will measure some kind of proximity uh, of a given node back to the node, uh, to the starting node u, right? Uh, what are some problems with this? One problem is that this must be, if you want to pre-compute this, you have to do it once for every node, right? Because proximities from every starting node, node u to every other node will be different, right? So this is only suitable for let's call them sub-web scale applications, right? Where 
the, where you don't necessarily have the entire web graph with trillions of nodes. Okay? How would this, for example, look like? I could create this simple graph where I say, here are the computer science conferences, and here are the uh, computer science authors, and an author is connected to a conference if they publish papers at that given conferences, right? And now I could ask myself, you know, I take this conference called ICDM, which is International Conference on Data Mining, and I say, you know, what are the closest conferences to ICDM? What are the most important conferences uh, close to ICDM, right? And the way I would say this, a conference is more similar to, ICM, to ICDM if there is a lot of people who publish at that conference and at, the, um, at ICDM as well. Right, and if I do topic specific page rank with the teleport set uh, to be at ICDM, then I'm essentially saying I will start the random walk here, I walk, and you know, how likely am I to end up at any of the other conferences? And if I do this, um, here, are, here are the results. So this is our starting conference, and then the way to read this plot is that um, it starts, um, it starts, I think, here, and then the conferences are sorted in decreasing order, right? So what are the most, sim most similar conferences to ICDM? It's the KDD, which is the best data mining conference, and then you have a more mat uh, mathematical data mining. PKDD is European data mining conference. PAKDD is Pacific Asia data mining conference, right? Then you have ICML, which is machine learning, data engineering, databases. Um, this is a data mining journal, uh, European machine learning, uh, knowledge management. Yes? Why are we looking at only partition graphs? Like, doesn't, wouldn't this work on a, a web graph as well? Oh yes, this works on any kind of graph. This works on web graphs, but even if I ask you, I ask you this simple question, how would you tell me what conferences are similar to each other? Here's one way to do that, right? Um, and it's actually quite a principled way. Because if I ask you how will you measure similarity between conferences, it's not clear, right? And this now allows you to measure similarities between conferences by creating this graph. But of course, this can work on any graph. It doesn't have to have this bipartite structure. Yes? Uh, wouldn't the resulting sim rank be similar if you just folded the graph over? Um, you can fold the graph over, but it doesn't, uh, um, the, doesn't uh, help you with anything. Weight, i.e., like the number of overlapping participants, not proportional to the sim rank? Uh, no. So, so this is, it's more than just saying how many co authors have two, two conferences in common. Because it also counts where do those co authors uh, publish, right? You can have five co authors in common and they only publish at these two conferences, which, is maybe, which would be more powerful than two other conferences where you have these co authors in common, but they each publish very little here and publish everyone else as well, right? So the random walker, we kind of get diffused and lost. So this is better than just that, right? So, so if you think about these random walkers, they have a lot of kind of super cool properties. They discount for the degree, they discount for how long is the path, they account that there is multiple things in common, all these things kind of nicely fused together. Good point, yes? Uh, consider the edge weights also, that also includes- Oh yes, so what you can easily do, right, in everything that I told you, you could assume uh, weighted edges, right? And what would that mean is that when the random walker comes to a node, it doesn't flip a coin at random, but you could flip the, uh, choose the destination based on the edge weight. And if you have some way to, to set the edge weight, then edge weights would be awesome. Okay, that's a great point. Um, I show you one more application. Uh, Actually, this is, this, is, uh, uh, this is basically the default recommender system that is running at Pinterest. And if I did the calculation correctly when I was walking to the class, it's making more than a billion recommendations a second, okay? So this really runs uh, super scalable. So, and it will, be, it will be using the technology or the algorithms I just showed you. So um, what's Pinterest? Uh, Pinterest is an application or a website essentially for people to do visual discovery or to get ideas. And the way it works is that you have these images that are called pins, but these pins are just bookmarks to websites. So essentially when people browse the web, they find an interesting web page with a, I don't know, an interesting, let's say, product, and then they can save that into Pinterest as a pin, and essentially this is an image, description, and a link to the target web page. And what do people do is they, they take these pins and they save them into collections called boards. 
Okay? So, you know, I could take this bag and save it into my collection of bags I like. Because maybe I'm just in the market of, for a new bag because my backpack is, I don't know, too ugly or old or whatever. Right? So this is kind of the use case. And if you say, where is the graph here? This is the graph, right? People take these pins and they pin them into these collections that they create. And this graph is actually amazingly humongous. You have around 4 billion of these pins. You have around 3 billion of the boards. And you have about 200 billion of these connections, right? Where basically I can take this bag and save it into my bag collection. And then somebody else may discover my collection of bags and say, oh, I like these three bags. I'll save them to my collection. So that bag will then, will then belong to some other collection, right? So essentially what this means is that you have these objects that users curate uh, into collections. And you have 200 billion different curations, right? So this means that this graph of how basically tells you how these objects fit together and relate to one another. And this is great if you want to make recommendations. Because if two objects are similar, people will kind of pin them to boards together. Or if two objects have, let's say, similar aspects, again, they are likely to be pinned together in this, uh, in this huge graph. And what this allows you to do now, right, is like you can use this topic-specific page rank to start making recommendations. Um, the, way, the way you could think of this is, I give you a, an input pin. Here it is, you know, something, uh, healthy chocolate strawberry shake. Like, awesome, right? Um, and you, I say, what are the pins, right? This pin, for example, belongs to 250 boards, right? So this pin has degree 250 um, on, this, on, this, on this graph, right? So now I could say, I will start the random walker at this pin, and I will see what other pins do I, what's the proximity of all other um, 4 billion pins uh, to this starting pin. And if I do that, uh, here, are the, here are the recommendations, right? And they are all about, like, the first one is awesome, right? It's about chocolate dipped strawberry smoothie. And then, you know, it's more smoothies and more smoothies, and some are healthier, some are um, strawberry, some have chocolate, vanilla, and so on, right? And what is interesting is that if I have this as a starting pin, this would be my recommendation. But if the user engages, let's say, with three more pins, then we kind of see that the user doesn't care about strawberries, but they're really about chocolate, right? So if now I set my teleport set to be these three nodes, do I get different recommendations, right? And here are the recommendations now. And notice that, you know, uh, maybe here is a, here's a smoothie. This is actually the, the chocolate uh, strawberry smoothie. But you see kind of chocolate totally took over, right? And this is all done essentially using this bipartite graph and doing personalized page rank on top of this uh, bipartite graph where the teleport set is the, are the pins that the user has recently uh, engaged with, right? So how, how do you do this? You take a pin and you look what boards it belongs to, right? And this will now create you um, um, uh, the bipartite graph between the pins on the top and boards uh, at the bottom. And of course, you then put everything together. Oops, sorry. Um, and you have this humongous, uh, humongous graph, right? And now what is the idea? The idea is that you will be given some query node or a query set of nodes f at which you will now want to start uh, your random walk. And you will want to uh, get a sense of what is the proximity according to this graph structure of all the other nodes in the graph. And uh, this, is, this is what you can do. And you know, the pseudocode, at least in principle for this is amazingly easy. What you can actually do is you can simulate these random walks very, very fast. So you don't have to run power iteration, but you can actually simulate the random walks, right? So the idea is that if this would be my query node, I would simply simulate the random walk I showed you above where you pick a random board and then you pick a random pin on the board, go there and increase the counter for that node. And then you decide, do I want to restart or do I want to keep going? And you keep going and you keep increasing counters, whoever you visit, until you restart. Um, and um, you can run this uh, blazingly fast. You can run about 100,000 steps of this in about 20 milliseconds. So this means that um, you can very quickly get these visit counts, right? And you can then return nodes 
according to this uh, visit counts and you take, you return the top, uh, the top nodes, okay? So why does, why does this work so well? One reason is that in the recommendations you have, we said, let's say four billion of these nodes. But what you care about is only the top thousand that are most close to the query node, right? You only return about thousand results for a recommendation, not, not uh, half a billion results. So you don't really care, you know, is, is some node at rank 7,000 or at rank 100,000? So you don't care. All you care about is what are the nodes in the top thousand? So because the random walk has this nice, nice property that it stays local in the graph, the runtime of this algorithm does not depend on the size of the graph, right? Because you only visit kind of the local neighborhood. And you know, the other uh, four billion nodes this way, we will never even visit them. So who cares, right? Because all, all I only care about are the top nodes, okay? So the idea is that now you can output top 1,000 pins with the highest visit count. Uh, as it was nicely asked before, you can put in um, weighted edges. Uh, for example, where weighted edges come in very handy is if you want to make language specific recommendations, right? If you have a user from Japan, but they are looking at English pin, then you can say, I want a random walker that starts this, uh, this English pin, but kind of prefers to walk towards Japanese type of content, right? So if there are Japanese pins on the board, it will choose those first before going over any other pin. And this way you can kind of create this language biased uh, results. And that's really good because every, every culture, every language has kind of a different view of how things uh, fit together. So that's one thing. And then the other thing you can do is you can come up with this method that's called uh, early stopping, right? Like e even if you simulate these random walks, really like simulate them um, um, uh, kind of using this Monte Carlo approach, um, you could simulate them for a fixed number of steps. You could simulate it for, you know, let's say 100,000 steps. But what you can also do is you don't care to simulate them too long. All you care about is for you to discover the top 1,000 closest pins to the starting pin. So one way you could say is to say, I will keep walking until the pin at rank 1,000 has been visited by at least 20 times. And when you visited it 20 times, you say, okay, now I'm certain enough that, you know, this is really at the rank uh, 1,000 and I can stop. All right? Yes? for every node. You still have to run this for every node. You do that in Pinterest? Exactly. You run it in real time. You don't care because it's so fast, right? You don't pre-compute anything. You're just running it, all right? So what, what do you do? So there are a few more things that are important. First thing is that the Pinterest graph is humongous, right? It's over 200 billion edges. Uh, but it turns out you don't need all the edges. So what you can come up is you can come up with a way to clean and prune this graph to make it more kind of topically focused. So what does this mean? One thing that it means is that you wanna remove super popular pins and super, uh, super popular or super big boards, right? So you don't want to, to hit, you know, Lady Gaga in the Twitter graph, right? Because if you hit Lady Gaga, it just like the random walker shatters because she has so many followers. Or at least Lady Gaga used to be the most followed person on, on Twitter. I don't know who that is today. Um, but you know, maybe it's the, it's the president or someone else, doesn't matter. But if the random walker hits a super high degree node, it has so many options that it totally kind of shatters and scatters. So you wanna remo uh, remove these big nodes, both in the, on the pin side, but more importantly on the board side, you wanna take boards that are too diverse and prune them down. So at the end, what you can do is you can take um, the pin nodes and you can cut the number of edges in your graph to around only 20 billion, and you can store the entire graph in around 200 gigabytes of memory. So you can just put this in a, in, in, in a given server and just uh, run it. So why is, this, why is this good? Because it's uh, blazingly fast. Um, a single machine can run 1500 random walks in parallel. So you know each random walk takes let's say 10, 20 milliseconds, and you, you can do 1500 in parallel. Um, you, you can fit the entire uh, graph in memory. Um, and if you want to scale the system, you just add more machines, right? So it's amazingly um, bulletproof. Um, and this really uh, has, a, has a big impact at Pinterest. Um, so basically, if you open the app, this is, you, will, you are guaranteed to see pins uh, due to this very simple 
uh, random walk method, right? So exactly kind of the content we are learning um, in this class. So I wanted to show you this is because these types of random walks approaches are one of the most kind of bulletproof and well understood and also amazingly scalable approaches for recommender systems. And why is scalability important? It's important because um, renting hardware is expensive, right? Renting thousands of machines from Amazon costs you uh, many millions of dollars. So you want to be efficient, right? And this is amazingly elegant because you just load the graph in memory and you can make a lot of recommendations per second um, at, at a very cheap price, right? So now let me uh, summarize. What did we learn? We learned kind of about three page rank variants. We learned about the normal page rank where essentially the teleport set are all the nodes in the graph and the probability of landing is uniform across all the nodes in the graph. So this was called the normal page rank. Then we talked about topic specific page rank that some people also call personalized page rank. And the idea, the idea here is that you teleport that the random walker, random surfer teleports to a specific subset of pages, right? So, and the idea is that nodes can have different probabilities uh, of landing, right? So imagine, that this could be the probability vector of landing where the random walker never lands at these two nodes, you know, but lands at this guy at 50% uh, of the time and so on. And then the, we talked about random walk with restarts, which is essentially topic specific page rank where the teleport is always to the same starting node. So your teleport vector, if you think about it, can look like, you know, zeros. There is a one, this is where we always land and then more zeros. Right? And these are, this is how these things uh, differ from one, uh, from one another. And if there is one kind of conceptual thing to remember, then this is the thing to remember. Okay? Uh, good. Do people have any questions? Yes. Oh, great. Go um, ahead. Could you use random walk with restarts to generate a bigger set S to then run topic specific page rank on? Great question. So the question is, could you use the random walk to kind of expand the seed set um, and then run um, a topic specific page rank on it. Yes, you could. Uh, this kind of seed set expansion techniques using random walks are amazingly popular when you have um, little labeled data, right? So for example, one other place where we use this at Pinterest is to discover sensitive content, right? Uh, what do I mean by sensitive content, right? Like, you know, uh, 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 porn is a trivial version of that, right? But like people like to, to, to pin things that are similar together. So you can have a couple of, let's say, porn images, and then you can do this and you discover lots, lots more of those. Or you can have, you know, kind of uh, self harm type images that uh, pins that people pin. Again, you can start from a small seed set and expand to, to the rest, and then you can verify and remove. Uh, that sensitive content. So a lot of this type of random walk techniques are used where, you know, you have kind of a trusted start seed set and then you want to expand, expand it. And this can be very useful for content labeling. You create the graph on top of it and then surface those as candidates. Yeah, good question. Good. All right, I could talk ab uh, about this a very, very long time, but uh, moving on. So now what I want to uh, uh, teach you in the second part of the lecture is to talk about spam on the web and how do you deal with that. Um, and we'll be using, and the method we'll talk about, it's called trust rank, okay? So let me give you kind of the introduction, right? So spamming or spam, the way it's defined, it's kind of any deliberate activity to boost some web page's position in the search engine results. Um, and uh, that's kind of in conflict with, uh, with, the, with the page's real value, right? So any, any almost like search engine optimization is, is in some sense spam, right? Um, and uh, spam, are, the way we'll think of it, these are web pages that are a result of this spamming activity. Um, and this is a very broad de uh, definition. As I said, the search engine optimization industry uh, might disagree with this, right? And the estimate is that about 10 to 15% of all web pages on the web are, are spam. So they are there for the purpose of boosting the value, the prominence of some other uh, web pages. Okay? 
So how does this, how do the search engines work, right? So the way they work is you, you have the, the web graph and you create the web crawler, where basically you take a set of web pages and then you start doing the breadth first search uh, over them to discover the pages of the web, right? So the only way for you to discover the page on the web is to navigate to it, right? So this means that in principle, if nothing points to, to a given page, Google should never be able to even find that page, right? Because they basically have a web crawler, a web spider that goes over this uh, net, this net of the web and identifies the web pages, right? And then what do you do? You index those web pages uh, by, by keywords. And then whenever a search engine comes, you find pages that include those keywords, somehow sort them and return that to the user. Um, and you know, early uh, uh, page, um, page ranking, this was kind of before Google, the idea was that you wanna order pages based on how much of the query they match, right? Um, and usually the way first search engines would order the pages was the number of times the query words appeared on the page and maybe the prominence, prominence of that word position, whether that word appeared in the title or in the header. So um, the first spammers, uh, this is kind of when I was young and I was doing this actually. So what did you do at that time? The idea was the following, right? Um, when people started to use search engines, you wanted your pages to be, um, you know, to be, to be high in the search ranking, right? Um, and uh, the idea was, right, that I wanna exploit the search engine to bring, uh, to bring people to my own website. Uh, and the way I would do this is that my page is ranked as high as possible, right? And the way maybe I could do that is maybe I'm selling t-shirts, but I may pretend to be about movies because when people search movies, I would wanna be on the top. Um, and uh, right, how would, what would be uh, 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 techniques to achieve this um, in the early days? So they, here are two strategies. One strategy that, that people used to do was the following. You would take the word movie and you would add it thousand times to your web page, but then you would set the text color to be the background color. So this happens usually like you would come to a web page, there is this much of it useful, and then you have this much scroll down and, and it's all empty to you. But if you would select with a mouse, you would see it's full of text. And this was a very simple way how you could fool the early search engine that you are about movies, even though you might be selling t-shirts, right? Just because you added all this text kind of below, below the fold, you masked it out so it had the same color as the background color, so uh, it wouldn't bother the user. But search engine would think that this is, uh, that this is a regular part of the web page, so it would um, index that and it would say, oh, if you say movie so many times, you must be about movies, so we will rank you high, right? That's one option. Another option that people also do is you run query movie on, on, uh, on the search engine to get the, the target results, see what, what web page came up on top, and then you just copy that page and, uh, into your own page and make it invisible again by setting the, the background color to be the same as the text color. Um, and people really used to do this uh, a lot and it really worked, okay? So, um, and then what Google's solution to this, what is called term spam, because you are now spamming terms and trying to, to look your document, your web page, the, as if it talks about a given category or a given topic, a given query. The idea was that then, um, um, can you use the, the link information to prevent this type of spamming? And this is what, what Google did, right? Google basically said two things that, that really made it uh, work. First was something that is called anchor text. What they said is, in order for me to surface this web page, I don't care so much what the web page itself is saying, but what do all these other people who have links pointing to it say about it? And anchor text is the, is the text of the link that has the, uh, that is underlined. So basically in order to surface this page, you would look at what are the, what is the link texts of everyone pointing to the page. And this way, it's much harder to, 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 to fake or spam that because now you have to convince all these page owners to, to say that you are about movies even though you are about t-shirts, all right? So this is what is called the anchor text, right? These are the words that appear um, in the text of the link um, and the text around it. And Google actually was using this as a way to index web pages rather than looking at the content of the web page itself. 
right? And then they were using, using PageRank as a tool to measure the importance of the web page on the web. So the idea was if you are a trusted web page, your page rank will be high and people around the web who link at you will use the proper keywords um, to, um, uh, to, to refer to you. And I have an example of this. Uh, I, okay, I'll, um, maybe I first tell you why this works and then I'll show you an example. So, um, you know, what would happen for our, uh, why would this work? Why would this get rid of our hypothetical uh, t-shirt seller, right? By t-shirt seller putting a lot of movie words on the web page, it wouldn't uh, help him because others who link to, to the web, to that web page wouldn't say that it's about movies. They would say it's about t-shirts, right? And his page isn't very important, so it won't be ranked so high either in the t-shirts or movies because not too many people point to it. So it has a low page rank score, right? So um, what could, what could uh, the, the t-shirt seller do? A t-shirt seller could go create 1,000 web pages. Each one would link to his, uh, uh, with the word movie uh, in the anchor text to, to his web page where he's selling um, t-shirts. And uh, right, maybe these pages have no, uh, no links in, so they get little page rank, but, but because they all point to the, to, uh, to, the, to the target page with the keyword movie, maybe that will boost the, the, the score of the target page, right? Um, of course, the t-shirt seller can beat truly important movie pages like IMDb, but the, the, they can um, increase uh, their own um, importance quite a bit. And I'll show you one example. Uh, this is a bit uh, from a few years ago, but you know, US presidents don't seem to be too popular in the last few rounds, right? So what people did is uh, uh, through this anchor text trick, if you would search for miserable failure on, on Google, this would be the top result. And the way this was done is that people created a lots of web pages who would point to, the, to this particular web page um, with the anchor text miserable failure. And then it came, uh, it came on top. Another one that was funny was if you used to search for French military victories, it would correct you and say French military defeats. Uh, so that was another one. Okay, right. but um, you see, and, and here, right, um, actually it's an article about uh, uh, this going wrong. And this was now, you know, uh, 14, 15 years ago, right? Uh, but early search engines would suffer and it was easy to fool them. So this is, these activities are called spam farming, right? Um, and uh, you, you, right, this was kind of the early, the early iteration. Now, how about the, you know, the round two of this fight, right? Um, as Google became the dominant search engine, uh, spammers be be became kind of to try to figure out how to fool Google. And what they figured out is to create this notion of spam farms that were developed to kind of concentrate the page rank and then funnel it to a single web page. Um, and uh, link spam is, ba this is the term that denotes creating the link structures to boost page rank of a particular page. And you have likely seen web pages like this when you go to some random domain that have all these links pointing around and these links are there just to boost the page rank score, okay? So what I wanna do now is we wanna do some calculations. How would you create a spam farm? What kind of topology you wanna create to create the spam farm? And then we'll talk about how do you detect a spam farm, okay? So from the web spammers point of view, there are three types of pages. There are pages that are called inaccessible, and these are pages that the web spammer does not have access to. Then there is a set of what are called accessible pages. These are the pages that the web spammer does not own, but you know, they can post a comment and include a link in the comment. Uh, and you see this all the time when basically people post some bogus text and a link um, that again points to some web page. These are, this, this is what we'll call accessible pages. So this means pages the spammer doesn't own, but they can post a link on those page to point wherever they want. And then we have the owned pages, which are basically completely controlled by the spammer. Um, and uh, they may spam multiple domain names, multiple sites, and so on. Now, now what does the spammer want to do? Spammer wants to maximize the page rank score of the target page T, okay? So the idea is that 
you, we can create as many links from the accessible pages um, as possible to the target page T. And then we want to create a link farm to get the page rank multiplier effect. And one of the one strat one link farm topology to do this would be the following, right? This is now the picture of the entire web where you have this inaccessible part of the web that you cannot touch because you don't own. You have this accessible part of the web. These are pages where you can post comments. And um, this is your target page T that you want to boost its page rank score. And then these are the red ones are the pages you own. And what you can do is the following. From the accessible pages, you create links to your target page. And then the target page links to your owned pages and owned pages point back. So these links are bidirectional and these links are uh, unidirectional, right? And let's say that you know we have millions of these pages M uh, that we own uh, here on the right. So now let's try to calculate how, how much can we boost the page rank score of page T, right? So does page T benefit if we go through this elaborate process and how much does it benefit? So here is how we'll think about this. We will label X as the page rank contribution by the accessible pages, right? So as accessible pages, blue ones point to the target page T, this is the, uh, the T gets X amount of page rank, whatever is the value. Um, and let's say Y is the page rank of the target page T, okay, the, the, the page we care about, right? Then if we say what is the page rank score of every forum page, uh, uh, this means of every red, uh, red node, what is it? Right? Um, notice here I have M and N. M is the number of, this is not the matrix that we had before. I'm sorry if it, it's confusing. It's the number of pages I own. And N is the size of the web. Right? So now if you say, what is the page rank score of a red node? It is the page rank score of my target node T multiplied by beta divided by the number of pages I own. Right? Because Y has M outlinks. So every red node gets 1 over m times whatever is the page rank score of y times beta uh, page rank because of the random walker making a step. And this is now the contribution due to, due to the random jump, right? 1 minus beta divided by the size of the web. Okay? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So um, this, is the, this is the first thing. So I can write this out and say the page rank score of Y equals X. This is the stuff that comes from the blue pages plus beta times M, which is the number of pages I own times the page rank score of each of the M uh, pages I own. This is this thing plus um, whatever the, the node Y gets due to the random jump. Okay, so all we need is to say what's the page rank score of every farm page? That it only depends on the page of the on the page rank score of the page uh, y, the target page. Uh, this is the number of pages I own. This is the teleport parameter uh, beta. And then I say, okay, what's the what is it for the y? Y gets the contribution x from the blue part. And then this is the score of every red node. There is m red nodes total. I multiply by beta. And then this is one minus beta times one over n. 1 over, 1 over n is the 1 over the size of the web graph. And this is now my equation to uh, compute the page rank score of y. Now if I simplify this and I multiply um, with, beta and, uh, with beta and m, what do I, what do I get? Um, I get m to cancel and I get beta squared times y. This x remains. And then when I multiply in here, I get beta times beta minus 1 times m divided by n. So that's here, and then this term um, remains. And then what I will do is this particular term, right? 1 minus beta divided by n, this is super small, right? 1 minus beta is, I don't know, 0.2. This is 1 trillion. This is so small, I don't even know what to do with it, so I'll just ignore it, okay? Um, and then now that, that I got uh, rid of this guy, I, I can now solve this equation for y, right? And if I solve it for y, here is what I get. I get y equals x divided by, 
by one minus uh, beta squared plus some C times M over N, right? I have this M over N, right? Um, and the C is a constant which is beta divided by, by one plus beta. Okay, so um, what does this mean? This, the, the most important uh, part here is the following. So I will take this equation, take it to the next slide and uh, continue my explanation. Uh, all right, here, right? So here is my equation, here is the definition of this C. And what is important to notice is the following. First is what is the value, um, what is the value of, um, of this thing here, right? Like one minus beta squared. One, one over one minus beta squared is let's say 3.6 if beta is 0.85, right? So this, this would be something that is, that, is, uh, that is multiplied by something greater than one. So whatever is the, whatever is the, uh, the, va the value I get, I actually multiply it with a nice factor that is greater than one. Another thing um, to notice is that um, I have this, um, this, this m over m, right, times the constant. So basically I got two good things out of this. First, I got this multiplier effect, right? The page rank score of y is not just x plus something, it's x times 3.6. So that's the first thing I got for free. And then the second thing I got from this is that if I make m large, then I get this linear factor here that says the more spam farm I, er I own, the bigger this part will be, right? So in some sense, I can make y as big as possible if I make m as large as possible. m is number of spam pages I own, okay? So this is how you can create an effective spam farm. We achieved two things out of it. First thing we achieved is the multiplier effect. So X gets multiplied by 3.6, right? If there would be no spam farm, this would be one. So this is far better. And then the other thing we learned from this is from this ratio is that if I make a big M as big as possible, the bigger I make it, the more, the, the bigger this ratio will be. So the more, uh, the higher the page rank score of target uh, Y will be, okay? So I can make page rank as large as possible using this kind of spam farm topology. Are there uh, any questions? Yes, go. Like, I mean, if you just own a lot of spam web, uh, websites and you just point to some website, like, wouldn't you be achieving basically the same thing? Exactly. If you own a lot of spam pages yeah. and you multi and you own and you set them to a given target, then the bigger you make this, the bigger fraction of the web you own, the bigger the page rank will be. With this. Oh, there is, there is this 3.6 here, which give, which comes for free. Mm. But isn't n still much larger than m? n will be very, very large, I agree. N, m, n will be very, very large, but at the end, you don't care to be the most important page on the web. It's enough to be more important than other pages in the same category topic for the same query or whatever. Right, so, so it's not that now you want to be the most important page on the web. If that's the goal, of course, this has to be huge. But if you care about t-shirts, then, then these things may not be so huge. So even the X, isn't it too small? Because you have the accessible pages that we have. Their page is getting distributed to other things as well, right? And it's not just coming to T, it's going to other nodes. Correct. Um, the, whatever <laughs> comes from the accessible pages, the X is not the sum of the page rank scores of accessible pages, but it's the, the contribution that accessible pages have to T. So the point here is that you created the multiplier effect. So it's better than what it would be anyway. Now if it's good enough, that's a different question. Okay, so now how would you combat this, right? If you have people generating these spam farms and, and do a lot of farming, how, how, would, you, how would you get these this spammers, right? So um, there we talked about how do you, uh, how do you uh, combat term spam, right? This was the text that uses the background color, right? Basically you can analyze the text, 
um, and, and try to, and you can parse the web pages and figure out what's the foreground color and what's the background color and you can get, get uh, you can remove a lot of these issues. Or if you figure out that a certain word appears too often or is uninformative, you can prune it out and so on. Um, you can also use locality sensitive hashing to create, to detect um, um, approximate duplicate pages so that, um, so that uh, you remove all these spam farms. Even though, um, actually I had a friend of mine who created a website where the idea was for the Google to get lost. So he was generating web pages that looked real, but he could generate infinitely many of them. And uh, Google got lost quite a lot, but then stopped crawling at some time, right? So that's one. And then the second one is, how do you, what do you do with the link spam? Detection, basically the idea is that you want to detect and then blacklist structures that look like a spam farm. And then of course this leads to another war, which is, you know, how do you hide uh, a spam farm and how do you detect a spam farm? So I showed you how to create a spam farm. Now there is another art, how do you hide it? And then there is another art, how do you detect it? Um, and to detect spam farms, we will talk about this method called trust rank. And trust rank essentially is a topic specific page rank with a teleport set to the set of trusted pages. And trusted pages could be, you know, you know .edu domains or, uh, um, you know, .gov or .mil domains that are very, con very controlled and that are inaccessible. Use those as a trusted set and then continue from there. So I'll explain what this is in, I think, five slides. So the trust rank has the, uh, the, uh, the following idea. Uh, it's based on this principle of approximate isolation where the idea is that um, it is rare for a good page to point to a bad page. But um, bad pages tend to point to bad pages. So the idea is that we will want to start with a set of pages. Let's call this seat pages. And imagine we have an oracle, a human, to identify the good pages. Um, and um, as well as the spam pages um, in the seat set. And then the expensive task is in some sense, how do we know? propagate these labels um, from, the, uh, from the seed set to the rest of the graph, right? We want to make the seed sets to be as small as possible because they require human work to create them. So one idea to do is to create, to do what is called trust propagation. And the way you would do the trust propagation is that you would call a subset of pages that are identified as good, you would call them trusted. And then you would perform topic sensitive page rank with the teleport set equals to the trusted set of pages. And in this way, you are in some sense propagating trust uh, through the links, right? Each pa page gets a trust value between zero and one. And my, my trust is the sum of the trusts of the people that point to me. And whenever I point to someone, I take my trust and equally split it to the people I point. And there are two solutions. One solution is to simply say, I'll use some threshold value and mark all pages be below that threshold value as spam. Okay, so that's first solution to this. The idea is run personalized page rank with a teleport set set to the trusted web pages. You now have the proximity of every other page to this trusted set. If people are, if pages are far away from the trusted set, they, we don't trust them, we cut them out. Um, so how would you think about this, right? The way you could think about this is the following. You would say, let's the trust of each trusted page be equal to one. And let's say that each uh, trusted page uh, um, uh, P, we will set its uh, value of trust to be T sub P. And let's assume that page P has outlinks O sub P, o, right? So O are the outlinks and T is the trust of a given page. Then what I, I could do is to say the following. For each uh, um, of, the, of the pages Q that uh, uh, page O points to, I will transfer some trust over, right? So I will take my own trust divided by the number of links, my outlinks, multiply this with some discount factor beta, and this is what I send to my neighbor, right? Um, and then the idea is, right, that trust is as additive, right? Trust of the page P is some of the trusts conferred to P by uh, its uh, page, the, by the pages that in link to it, right? And if you um, if you think about this, 
This is essentially very similar to topic specific page rank, right? I basically say there is some page rank score of page p, it gets divided evenly by its outgoing neighbors, um, and it's passed along with probability beta, so the probability of not jumping. And uh, and then when when the page receives the trust, it sums it up from uh, across the links that point to it, right? So this idea of trust propagation, it's basically topic specific page rank with a, a teleport set to be a set of trusted pages. Um, that's essentially the idea. Now, why is this a good idea? It's a good idea because it allows us to uh, to worry about this that you know the degree of trust conferred by a trusted page decreases by the distance in the graph because we are multiplying with this factor beta here, right? Um, so the farther away you are from the trusted set, less less uh, trust you will receive. And then there is this notion of trust splitting where if a page has a lot of outlinks, it will take it trusts and split it very finely among all the outlinks. And if if the if the page has fewer links, then that that um, that uh, trust won't be chopped into small pieces, but it will be sent in bigger pieces to all the fewer outlinks, right? So the idea is that trust is split across all the outlinks. And then the last idea is that trust is additive, meaning that you can you sum up the trust that comes from the web pages. Um, now the question is, how do you pick the seed set? And you kind of have two conflicting considerations. First one is that human has to inspect each page in the seed set to make sure that the page is good. So this means that you want to make seed set as small as possible because um, otherwise it's too expensive. But of course, right, you must ensure that every good page gets an adequate trust strength. So in some sense you need to make sure that all good pages are reach reachable from the seed set uh, by, by short paths, okay? So this means that in some sense you want your seed set to be as diverse as possible, but you want it to be also as small as possible because you don't want, um, you don't want it to be too expensive. And then what are two heuristics that you could do this to, to select a, a seed set of k pages? One would be to do the page rank where you would pick, basically you would do the page rank on the entire web graph, you would take the k most highest page rank uh, scored pages. Um, and the idea would be that, right, the idea is that you, you can't get a bad uh, page, that it's hard to take a bad page and push its rank so high that it would be among top k most popular pages on the web, right? Another option would be that you could actually then take these k pages and manually um, verify them, right? Another option would be to use a trusted set of domains um, whose membership is controlled, right? Things like .edu, .mil, .gov, those things are uh, heavily controlled. Who can get, who can register the name uh, uh, a website under these types of um, uh, domains? Yes. Uh, theoretically, could the government skew our search results by because they're a trusted page and now they have a little more leverage and what else is trusted? Oh, great point, right? Could a, could a government uh, uh, tr skew the search results? Yeah, if, the, if, if you would blindly say everything that the government says I trust, then, then, then obviously uh, by government deciding who they want to link to, that would determine what, what is your belief about what is spam and what is not spam. So you maybe wouldn't want to do that, but you know, this is one of the ideas where the spammers generally don't have access to these types of domains. Now, if you think that the government is the spammer, then maybe you don't include them in your list, right? But good, it's an excellent point, right? Uh, it's a, I think what you are asking, it's a very good question, which is, you know, what is a representative diverse set of trusted web pages? And you want to be very careful, what do you put and who do you put um, in, in there? Yeah, thank you. Yes? Page rank score and a trust rank score, do you take some sort of weighted average then? Like, how do you then return results with these two different scores? Ah, great. Super question. So, what you could do right now is you would compute this trust rank score and just threshold. Okay? That's the idea right now. Now, given your question, sorry, um, given your question, you can do something smarter. All right? And this is what the real trust rank paper um, proposes. And it goes along your idea. Um, are there any questions before I 
give you kind of a second idea how to deal with this. Okay, so second idea. Second idea is to define this notion of spam mass, okay? And intuitively, the idea goes the following, right? Um, in the trust rank model, we start with a set of good pages and propagate trust. You could say, here is a complementary view, where we, you could say, what fraction of pages, page rank comes from the spam pages, right? So the idea is that you say, if I can estimate how much of your importance comes from the spam pages, then I know whether, whether you, are a, you are a spammer or not, right? Of course, in practice, I don't know all the spam pages, so I would need to estimate it, right? And the idea is that this is my web. Um, here are all the web pages. This is my trusted set. And I would like to estimate what is the spam mass of some, you know, random page uh, denoted by the red node. And here is what I would do. Our second solution that is, that would be the following. I would say, let R sub P be the page rank score of the page P. And let R plus sub P be the page rank score of P, um, where the teleport set is the trust, is a set of trusted pages, right? And then I can ask what fraction of pages page rank score comes from the spam pages. And the way I could estimate this is to say, what is the overall uh, page rank score of the page versus what is the page rank that comes from the trusted, trusted set? And if these two are widely different, if this is big but this is small, then the difference between the two essentially tells me what is the spam mass of the, of the, uh, of the page, right? So I would define the spam mass of a page P as the difference between the overall page rank minus the trusted page rank divided by the overall page rank, right? And if you are a trust, if you are a spam page, the idea would be globally you seem very important, but from the trusted set of pages, you don't, you are not important at all. So whatever is the distance between, the difference between these two, that amount of page rank must have came to you through the spam farm. So here we are asking, what fraction of the difference between trusted and untrusted page rank came to that page? And if this ratio is high, then we would say this is a, this is a, this is a spam page. So we would filter out pages that have high spam mass, okay? Where spam mass is defined by this, and it's basically defined by the overall score minus the trusted score. The bigger this difference, the more, the more um, uh, suspicious a page is because it got its page rank score from somewhere else than the trusted set. And then hypothesis is that it got it from the spammers. Um, that's the idea for the spam mass estimation that allows us now to compare the overall page rank versus the trusted page rank. Great, um, any questions? So this is, was a good idea when you asked the question. This is one way to think about it, right? And it also shows you how you can use now page rank where you say, I can start anywhere. I only start at the trusted set. I want to look at the differences. And it allows you to very nicely kind of reason about the graph and how importances change when, wh based on where in, the graph the, where in the graph do you set the teleport set. Good. Um, any questions? Yes. Do you still need a threshold? Here you would set a threshold, but the threshold on this ratio not the threshold on absolute value. So what this allows you to do is you can have a page that has a very small page rank score, but as long as it relative spam mass is low, you would still keep that page. So this is why this is better. So the previous one would just say, keep the pages that have high value of this thing. And right now it says, keep the pages where the, the two numbers are about the same value. All right, good, yes. What about like pointwise like multiplication? between like the trust, which is going to be between zero and one, and then the regular page rank. Point-wise multiplication. Um, the, issue, the issue with that is that if one is big and the other one is small, the value will still be bigger than if both are small, right? So this is a better idea because it compares your overall importance versus the importance coming from the trusted thing, right? And kind of accounts that if, if a page may not be super, super important, as long as these two are about the same, we trust it. 
right? That's the idea that we want to say what's the discrepancy between what the page seems to be important versus how important it is from the trusted set. And as soon as there is discrepancy, we say you are suspicious, we filter you out. That's the intuition. Okay, uh, great, super. Thank you for coming to the class. Have a good weekend and see you next week.